you now. This is the book that I read with uh, Noah, uh, with that everyone who reads it must converse. If you know who I am, you know who he is most likely. Yes, I do still live indoors. You can see clearly this is not the street corner. This book was published in like 64 or something. Roland Topper is like a artist playwright, actor, real renaissance guy. And it says in the in the intro to this book, written by A. R. B. Russell, that he's known for making stage plays that are like shocking for the sake of being shocking. And that was a red flag to me when I picked up this book, because I was like, man, this is gonna be one of those books where like he just is like, ooh, it's shocking. I'm, and I'm not gonna like it, you know what I mean? Because that's like, I'm not into it, like, why, yo? It was just made into a movie in 76, uh, directed, starred by, with Roman Polanski. And I guess most people that read this book have already like seen the movie and like get that this is like, you know, a work of some kind of like surrealist horror or something, because that's how the movie frames it. I didn't really see the movie, I just saw one scene of it after I finished reading the book and I was like, yeah, I'm not watching this movie. Because it gave me it gave me immediately the sense that these things that you see on the screen are real and tangible events. There's none of the plausible deniability in the book. Mind you, I saw one scene, so I mean, what do I really know? But just immediately I got the idea that like this is like a thing that is probably true because you're seeing it, right? That's kind of how reality is. You see it, so you think it's there or think it's true, but it's not how things work. It's not. It's just not, just not how things are. So anyway, the tenant about this guy in Paris and like the, the whenever he gets the freaking he looking for an apartment, which are hard to come by. And this chick had an apartment, but she jumped out the window and she's not dead yet. And they're trying to get the apartment to someone else. So this kid, uh, Kelkowski, sure, why not? He um, rents it from the lady, the lady dies and stuff, and he like starts a little casual affair with her friend, and uh, he's just, he has a hard time getting along with his neighbors because he makes too much noise and everyone's real mean and rude. Like everybody's really rude in this book. And he just kind of starts losing his normals bit by bit because he's just trying so hard to like, be anodyne as best as he can, not uh, bother people. But then it starts to get out of hand, yada yada, the book continues, things happen, the book stops continuing. That's how the, that's how books work. Gosh, what, where am I at now? Am I, am I at the point where I start, yeah, let's just start talking about the book. So go along here to skip all of this stuff, which I will then immediately refer to at the point to which <laughs> you skip, so. This is the part where I say, no, just wait until you read the book and don't, don't watch the rest of this. So it starts with Kalkowski and he's kind of like chill. He's kind of a chill bloke. Everyone's kind of an asshole. Like it's very like weird just how like rude people are in this book. But yeah, he gets to the apartment. Um, but they're like, oh, so the woman who jumped off the roof, a woman jumped off the roof named uh, Celine or something. So he goes over to the uh, big old sick bay where she's at, all bandaged up, missing teeth. And this really hot girl is sitting next to her. She's like, oh, do you know her? And he lies like, yeah, I know her. You know, <laughs> um, and then she's he kind of wants to ask for the she has the apartment. And Stella is the hot girl, and he's like, she's like, um, it's me, Stella, blah blah blah. And she screams, and then like everyone is like, no one is like helping her when she screams. Like it's weird in the scene. Like no one is like, no no one rushes to her attend her. You know, Stella just breaks down and cries, and Galkowski is just like freaking. Freaking out because people are gonna think that he made Stella cry and not the screaming woman in front of them, which no one cares about. This guy across the other bed just drooling like he's not hearing anything, and that is like the main thing that I keep catching in this book. Is like people just don't see each other. You know what I mean? Like it, it makes the rest of the book where Kalkowski is just freaking out how he never has any like he never makes a move that doesn't affect another person. It makes that seem like that's the awkward thing. <laughs> I mean, that's maybe the only normal behavior in the entire book. So, yeah, so she dies, he gets to the apartment, and then he throws a party with like all of his homies from work, and, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry, he kind of hooks up with the girl, Stella, at the movie theater later that day. But the thing that's real awkward about it 
you know what I mean? And then just leaves and they don't like get each other's number or anything or whatever they did in the 60s. Okay, he goes to house warming party, he gets too loud and everyone is like really like mad at him for being really loud, like the neighbors are mad at him. Um, but he's all everyone's drunk and loud. Um, and he's able to see like one of the girls at his party is like cozying up to him suddenly because he has an apartment and she's getting a divorce and get kicked out of her place. And so he, he like does some real like, you know, he like kind of, he kind of curbs her, you know what I mean? Neighbors get mad at him and he just tells his friends to get quiet down and they get really raucous. And so he flips out on them and they all leave and make a big noise mess as they leave the apartment. And so now Kalkowski feels like he needs to like make up, make it up to his um, neighbors for being rude. But now all of his friends at work think he's weird too because he cares too much about, you know, being friendly to his neighbors and stuff. So he doesn't have any friends at work anymore and doesn't have any friends at his home. And every time he makes a noise, they're banging on stuff, you know, telling him to shut up. Blah, 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 the rest of the book happens. Um, the book is really just like him freaking out about stuff. During the whole thing of him freaking out, the, the whole, the main thing is like he's the only person in the entire city of Paris who actually like realizes that he has an effect on other people and that means something to him. Like he doesn't know everyone in the apartment. Like he doesn't really know anyone in the apartment. But there's new faces always coming out to him. Like, oh, do you know so-and-so? They made so much noise last night. And he doesn't know whether they're talking about them or someone else. And someone has a petition to get someone kicked out and he starts freaking out like, oh, you, you know, today it's them and I don't know who they are. And the next will be me and people are telling him the truth. And also like he's kind of rear windowing it up there because they have this shared bathroom and he can see the bathroom from his window. And, and so he's watching people go in the bathroom and some people go in the bathroom and just like stand still until they pull the chain and then leave. You know, they never, they never do anything, right? And that freaks him out because you know, why are they like this? There's just a lot of things that don't make any sense. Like he, he drops trash and then he goes and someone else picked it up. People are watching him, it's all very scary. So eventually he starts like losing time and he starts getting really sick and he, he finds like there's like women's like cosmetics in his drawer and he wakes up and he's been done up as a woman, he's dressing woman's clothes. The people, he's blaming them now, like, oh, they're trying to turn me into the last tenant. And so then he tries to, you know, throw it in their face and dresses up like a woman, walks around town, and again, no one knows he exists, no one pays attention to him. But then he gets the sense that this is only bringing him closer to the end where he's certain they're going to throw him out of the window just like she was not the window, call it a suicide. I'm missing something here in the story that I don't, oh yeah, somewhere in the wall there's like two incisor or teeth that he found like behind a dress drawer, just in the wall. And like a lot of stuff like that is in this book. This is weird stuff that are kind of non sequiturs. Like there's teeth in the wall, you know, okay. There's people getting thrown out, it's kind of whatever. He, he, he runs into Stella again, and they hook up and then leave each other again. It's just kind of, that's their relationship now. We can just get to the end here. It's a short, it's a short eight book. It's like 174. He decides to like run away. He runs away to Stella's apartment, stays at her apartment for like a day or something. And then she leaves to work for the day and he's still there and he sees his landlord knocking on the door incessantly asking if uh, anyone's in there. Um, or he doesn't see him through the keyhole, but he hears his voice from behind the door. And he was like, oh, then Stella must be one of them. I should have known better, yada yada. He starts going on another one of those. One of those things. He's like, oh, sure, that she's trying to kill him too. And then he gets hit by a car, but like the person who hit him in the car is his neighbor, so they'll take him back home. No, oh, it's so scary. And so they take him back home, and he goes in there, and he has a real big freak out looking out the window in the courtyard down below. And he sees freaking some like, you know, Vincent Price movie playing out down at the bottom. The women in the bathroom rubbing feces all over their faces and a bunch of, you know, massive red death stuff happening down in the courtyard. And he sees the executioner come in and starts to try not and do his door. And the next thing you know, he'd already jumped out the window. Next chapter. And there's the police and the 
people there like, oh no, we're not gonna suicide. And he starts freaking out like, oh, you all did this to me. You're some murderer. Spitting blood everywhere and smearing blood and everything. Just being, you know, totally, you know, letting loose as it were. And kind of just pissing everybody off even more until he eventually works his way up to like the top of the stairs to his apartment again and jumps out again. And then, you know, next thing you know, he's all bandaged up in a hospital. And he can't really see nothing, but then he sees a freaking a copy of him sit down and then Stella's there saying, oh, this Salome, it's me, Stella, do you recognize me? And he screams just like Stella, or Salome screamed in the beginning. Ooh, what a twist. Oh, also a twist, uh, Stella, he sees, Stella has like big old canine teeth, like a vampire or something, the end. Two stars, screw this book. So that, that freaking twist ending with the canine teeth, I was like, damn it, like, now I have to reread this book because I need to find out if there are any allusions to Stella being a vampire, but I'm not sitting through that book again just to get some clues to something that I don't even care about. She was clearly out during the day, right? There was never any, like, big allusion to blood that I remember at least, except for at the very, you know, the second to last chapter where homeboy's just smearing blood, blood on everything. Whatever, man. Whatever. So anyway, I, I'm gonna get to the part where I realize that this, 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 the problem is me, right? But just give me a minute. Bro is like, you know, paranoid and stuff, right? Because, you know, every time he moves, someone hears it. People are always conscious of him. He's conscious of the fact that people are always conscious of him. That does take a toll on you. And nothing that he does, except for like by the third act of the book, is beyond the pale, so to speak. Or what anyone else does, no one is like out there like giving him any clues that they're actually performing some grand concerted conspiracy against him. No one's doing that. It says in one of those stories that like um, Tchaikovsky, he, he was walking down the street feeling like everyone was a Martian and all these people were completely alien to them, to him. And even the um, the sexual um, flirting and stuff in the street was something that he never understood and he always felt alien to people for his entire life. Um, but that's just not true in this book because he did have many friends at one point and he has shown proof of understanding sexual chemistry in this book. So I think what that, what that is is more of a commentary on what the feeling of being alienated is like. Because it's a feeling that manifests itself as the thoughts that attempt to explain it. I think though, the book does recognize this, but it's very unclear when I read it. Like many things in this book seemed unclear because of the tone. Generally reading an author's work, I get a sense of how the author is, like how the author puts these words together. It, that has its own special meaning. But this being a translation of a French work, I got the sense that every single word put down here was meant to be completely understood as what it is. And none of that subtext of, uh, of, uh, of the author himself I didn't catch any of that. But that being the case, I, it kind of left me just judging the basic events of the story, judging like the character's mental process and being like, no, dude, you gotta, you know, cool out. <laughs> you know, kind of against my own, I'm judging it against my own experience of like being out of my damn mind. And it's, it didn't do me any f favors, I'll tell you that. Like, like I didn't, I didn't feel better at all for myself or about my own, you know, sense of reasoning. Probably looking at this guy completely spiraling out. Cause I didn't get it, it wasn't a special, you know, twist ending. There was no aha, it was, it, was, it was nothing but loose ends. You know what I'm saying? And also this is supposed to be a horror novel, right? But like, 
I wasn't, there was nothing scary about it. Even though the main character was scared, I wasn't scared, it wasn't scary. I'm just, you know, a third party observer looking at it like, bro, open the f door. Like, like you gotta do something, you know what I'm saying? But also, it makes me think that, you know, I've gotta be reading this book wrong, and by extension, every book wrong, because, you know, my own history of, you know, trying to find the line between psychosis and reality or, you know, mental distraction and true intuition. Like, all of this, you know, baggage is coloring my experience with the book, probably to the point where I'm completely missing the point of the book. Like, the book is probably about how easy it is to be manipulated or to manipulate oneself into, you know, doing something completely self-destructive. Or, or how selfish and myopic people are and, and how difficult it is to, I don't know. I don't know, whatever. I didn't like it, I don't, I, either I don't like it or I don't get it or both, or maybe I do get it and it's whatever, but I wasn't feeling it, man. I guess, I guess I'm actually kind of pissed off at it. Primarily because it just wasn't, if it was like a good reading experience, like if it was like lyrical in some sense, and I enjoy it just like following the words on the page, that would be good. But all I got was the sense that these book that these words are laid out for me to completely understand them. And as I understand them, they're written just like like a guy who's I don't know. I don't know who writes that kind of a book, right? Like like am I like am I Because like when you're in that corner, like you gotta I don't know man. I don't know. That's it. You know what the most dangerous thing in America is, right? 